when he wrote his immortal poem. God brought judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar because he thought that he built the kingdom of Babylon. And as a punishment, God took his reason away from him. We read in Daniel 4.25 that they shall drive thee from men. Thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen. They shall wet thee with the dew of heaven. And seven times, that is seven years, shall pass over thee till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men. Men set up their kingdoms, but He rules in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever He will. He is still Lord of the kingdoms. He is still King of kings and Lord of lords. Now the fourth thing that cannot be shaken in a shaky world is the church of the living God. Matthew 16, 18 tells us that the church is built upon a rock and the rock is Christ. I say also unto thee that thou art Peter and upon this rock and he wasn't talking about Peter. He probably took his finger and said, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Notice that. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Now the world hates the church. The world is against the church. They preach against the church. They do everything they can against the church against Christianity. But the church has a promise. The gates of hell cannot prevail against it. In chapter 12 of Hebrews, verse 22, But ye are come unto Mount Zion, unto the city of the living God, the heaven of Jerusalem, and an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than thou of Abel. Now, he says, you have not yet come to Sinai, that's the law, but you have come to Zion, that's grace. You have not come to Moses, but you have come to Jesus. And although they had lost all and everything that was dear to them, they still had something better. They had Jesus. And that's really all anybody needs. The church of God will stand. It may go through storms. It may stagger and weary and fall from one side to the other. But God will uphold His church and His church will not be shaken. It, it will be assaulted. It will be hated. It will be attacked. But it will stand. It will stand. I'm glad I belong to something that will stand. When I see everything falling down, I realize that I'm a part of the family of God. And the family of God will stand. It will stand. Some may depart from her. Some may desert her but others will remain and it will stand. And the fifth thing that cannot be shaken is the Word of God. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. Now, Satan has a trick. He has a plan. He knows he cannot take the Bible away from the people. He cannot deny the Bible because they believe the Bible. So what is he going to do? Well, he has a plan. Instead of trying to rail against the Bible, which he knows would be fruitless, he decides to pervert the Bible. And what does he do? He raises up certain so-called scholars and they write other Bibles. Not the old Bible, but new Bibles. And these new Bibles change very subtly the doctrine of salvation, the doctrine of the deity of Christ, 
very subtly, they make these little changes, one here, one here, one here, and one here, and they make just enough changes to cause people to have doubt about the Word of God. And they have the bookstores all programmed. When people come in to buy a Bible, they've just been converted, they want to know, what kind of a Bible should I buy? Oh, you must buy this Bible. The scholars have written this Bible. And it's a little different, but you'll like it because it's easier to read. And it's only $39.95 or $59.95. And we would advise you to buy this new Bible. And this new Bible perverts the way of salvation, perverts the deed in God, perverts His omniscience, His omnipresence. It perverts everything that's vital and essential for a Christian to know. They leave alone certain things because they have to have something in there that the people would recognize. But they pervert and water down and change the meaning of the words. Until today, there are over 50 different translations of the Bible and that means there are 49 different translations that are perverse and corrupt and wicked. And the poor people that have not been instructed go and buy these new Bibles and they wonder why it doesn't have the power the old Bible used to have. Now the King James Version of the Bible still has the breath of God in it. It has the life of God in it. And you need a King James Version of the Bible. And we have one on every table in here. So when you come into this church, you can pick up a King James Version of the Bible, which is translated from the Textus Receptus, which is the original, trans with the original manuscript. And in the King James Version, you get the true Bible. You get the true knowledge of God. You get converted reading that Bible. But Satan is so wild that he has changed his mode of operation. He has changed the Bible. And changing the Bible, people wonder why the Bible doesn't seem to have any power to them anymore. It's because they've got a perverted Bible. One particular new translation that's very popular with everybody has taken out over 1,000 words out of the Bible. Can you imagine that? 1,000 words have been deleted. That's the NIV. And then the American Standard Version has deleted hundreds of words also. And on and on it goes, perverting the Word of God. You remember there was a king named Jehudi. And Jehudi was given a message from the prophet and, and the, it was a message of judgment. He didn't like it. So he tore up the original manuscript that came to him and threw it in the fire. He is the first Bible changer. Threw it in the fire. And the prophet just wrote another one and sent it back to him. And Satan has tried to destroy the Bible down through the ages. He can't do it. The great unbelieving man who was a devil inspired man by the name of Voltaire. Voltaire hated the Bible. He lectured against it, went up and down the country, spending his life lecturing against the Bible. And he proclaimed from his pulpits around the country, he proclaimed that in 50 years there will not be a Bible left in the world. But do you know the house that he lived in is today the house of the American Bible Society. And Bibles are being printed in the house he lived in. God laughs last. God laughs last. The Bible says, He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. He shall hold them in derision. The Word of God cannot be shaken. The Bible I preached to you this morning is from the Textus Receptus, the original manuscripts, which is the pure Word of God. Now, consider the fulfilled prophecies of the Bible. Not one mistake in the old King James. Not one mistake in the uh, 
Texas Receptus Manuscript. Not one mistake in its marvelous <coughs> unity. Not one mistake in its instructability. Or in it is scientifically correct. God's Word. I paused last eve beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring, the vespers chime. And looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with the beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, he answered. Then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears out the hammers, you know. And so I thought, the anvil of God's Word, for age skeptics' blows have fallen upon. And though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unchanged, the hammers gone. The sixth. thing that cannot be shaken, that cannot fall, is the love of God. In Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. Paul's prayer for the Ephesian saints in Ephesus says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye be rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. God's love for His people will never stagger, never fail, can never be shaken. God's love is infinite in its source. It is eternal in its origin. It's monumental in its greatness. It is universal in its ethnicity. It is condescending in its sacrifice. It is manifested in its action. It is extravagant in its cost. It is sovereign in its bestowal. And it's everlasting in its duration. That's our Bible. The King James Version of the Bible. And I love that Bible because it's the true water from heaven. It's the cool water of the brook that, thir that slakes the thirst. The true Bible. And God revealed to Habakkuk, some called it Habakkuk, that the temple was going to be destroyed in the Old Testament. That the cities were going to be laid waste by invaders. And that the inhabitants of the city of Jerusalem were going to be slaughtered. And with all of that bad news, Habakkuk wrote this. If ever there was a man of faith, it's this Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. And having received that message from the Lord of the desolation that was coming upon the land, he wrote in Habakkuk 3 and verse 17, Though the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, the field shall yield no meat, and the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like hind's feet. That's the feet of a deer. And he will make me to walk upon mine high places. You know, there's something strange about the legs of a deer. A deer can plant his feet in the same tracks. In the same tracks. He's about the only animal I know of that can do that. That's why a deer and a goat can climb mountains. And he says he will make my feet track. What does it what the what, what the deer does in order to make traction up a mountain slope, he puts the front foot, takes the other front foot, foot, and puts it in the same spot where that one was, 
and he tracks right up the mountainside. And what Isaiah was saying, God makes my feet track with his footprints. God makes my feet track with his footprints. That means I walk in his ways. I walk in his steps. I walk where he leads me. The path is ahead. I can see his tracks and I step in this Bible. I step track by track until I see him face to face. In the darkest hour of the year, when the stars have all gone out, courage is better than fear and faith is better than doubt. One last thing, the child of God will never be shaken. 1 John 2, 17, And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Dr. W. B. Henson was a great preacher. He went to a doctor one day, and the doctor told him he had only a few months to live. Dr. Henson walked out in his garden, and he looked up at the mountains as they lifted their majestic heads heavenward, and he wrote this song, this poem. When the mountains have forever ceased to be exalted in towering strength above the cities of the earth, when the river has run its last mile, when seas have passed forever from its universe, when the sun has risen and set in all its beauty and glory for the last time, yea, when the moon and the stars have forever ceased to give their light, when the mighty trees of the forest have shed their last leaves, when all nature has departed to its final rest, I shall live on 